Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Cedare Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. The ICANN podcast has been made possible by support from MD Financial Management and Scotiabank, proud financial partners of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and Canada's ophthalmologists. We'll share our experiences as ophthalmologists today and tackle some of the challenges we face as healthcare providers. Are you ready, Cedare? Let's do it, Guillermo. Let's do it, Cedare. On this episode of ICANN, we speak with Dr. Vivian Yin, an associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Dr. Yin graduated from Johns Hopkins University with an honors degree in biology. She completed her medical training and ophthalmology residency at the University of Toronto, graduating with multiple surgical and academic awards. With an interest in oculoplastics, she pursued a two-year oculoplastic and orbital oncology fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. She has spoken internationally on topics of periocular and orbital oncology, aesthetics, and lacrimal system. Dr. Yin is actively involved in research and teaching as well. She trains fellows in oculoplastic surgery, as well as ophthalmology residents and medical students. She's also a reviewer for multiple international peer-reviewed scientific journals, including the British Journal of Ophthalmology and the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology. She has been recognized for her accomplishments by research awards and grants from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, and the Physician Services Incorporated, or PSI, Foundation. It is really, really great to have you here, Vivian, and we welcome you to the ICANN podcast. Thank you, Guillermo. That is a very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, I guess let's dive into the topic, because aside from everything that you've been doing with your practice, with teaching, you're very well recognized and very well involved with global ophthalmology. So what does global ophthalmology per se mean to the broader ophthalmology community? And how do you support the work of that particular sector? That's a great question. Um, there has actually been quite a controversy over the terminology over the years. Um, historically, it used to be called international ophthalmology, mm-hmm. but the term global ophthalmology started to appear around the 40s and really grew in popularity in the 90s. Oftentimes, people ask me, what's the difference? Why do you even care whether it's called international ophthalmology or global ophthalmology? And the big difference is that international ophthalmology can be considered a subsection of global ophthalmology. Global ophthalmology is really about promoting health, um, both through medicine as well as public health. And it focuses more on capacity building, development, and it's an intersection of multiple specialty or multiple disciplines. And I would say for most of us, we when we think about global ophthalmology, we initially think about someone from the Western world traveling to a developing country, and then maybe operating on hundreds of patients over a very short course of time. Mm -hmm. I think that's slowly changing now. uh, And I'm very glad to see that change um, as more focus is now on teaching, capacity building, skills transfer, um, both clinically and surgically. And then in terms of my involvement, I would say, um, you know, I started off just like everyone else doing what historically was done, going to the Philippines and you know, operating on patients with um, counting fingers or light light perception cataracts. Uh, But I would say most of what I do now is actually teaching. So I teach a lot internationally, both surgical and clinical skills. And then the other hat I wear is my MPH hat, which uh, gets me involved in a lot of program planning or program development, quality assurances, um, as well as some policy work and advocacy. Oh, that's amazing. And that's in addition to your regular practice back in Vancouver, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a lot of the time I hope I have a clone so I can do both at the same time. <laughs> and so percentage wise, in terms of time, how, how do you divide yourself between your regular practice at the university and then your, your global ophthalmology duties? 
It's really a passion of mine. And I think you really, if you are committed and, and interested in this work, you have to carve out time. We all have a million things in front of us that we have to do. We're all busy clinicians and researchers and academics. I would say I carve out about 30% of my time that I reserve just for global mm-hmm. health uh, or public health related work. A mm-hmm. um, lot of it is not funded, but when it's a passion of yours, I think you yeah. don't really um, kind of nitpick on the amount of financial reward you obtain from it. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, And what types of patients do you find yourself treating now mostly or teaching about to transfer that skill and in which particular countries? So being an oculoplastic surgeon, most of what I teach is oculoplastic surgery at this point. Um, So I have a longitudinal program of fellowship training. Uh, It was our first pilot project um, Mm. that's been going on in Nepal now. This is year five. Um, and, um, other countries I've worked in is Rwanda. I did some teachings there with some of the private, um, residency programs, uh, as well as Tanzania and India. How, how, how do you get involved with that? Like, how would you recommend to somebody who has that particular interest? And we have so many options uh, available, uh, like Orbis or uh, Site Life and different organizations, individuals, or uh, Help Me See is another one that comes to mind. You know, how, how does one start doing that? It really doesn't require much. There's so much work to be done. And I would say one of the mistakes I see people do is they expect to get involved and immediately jump into the field. It doesn't mm-hmm. quite work that way. Opportunities present themselves. I would say if you have an interest, stay connected, stay um, in the loop with all of these organizations, every one of them do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, so give you an example. I myself, I'm not involved with just one organization. I work with quite a different uh, spectrum from NGOs to academic organizations, and each of them serve a different purpose uh, and a mm-hmm. different need for the partner countries. Okay. Um, the one thing I would say is definitely partner with an organization. Um, it may seem like um, um, that you get more credit if you start your own program, but the truth is the need a lot of time is greater than what you can provide. Um, and really partnering with these large organizations that have huge resources to fill the blanks that you cannot uh, will be Mm -hmm. much more impactful for your local partner. Right now, we're kind of in the second year of a global other thing, a global pandemic, and we're talking about global ophthalmology. So how has this other global thing impacted your work and impacted the, uh, the area, the community of global ophthalmology as a whole? Well, I would say it's twofold. On one hand, it really rejuvenated the community because for the first time, global health is actually on everyone's mind. Doesn't matter Mm -hmm. if you're Mm -hmm. in medicine or not. Sure. Um, It's on a side note, a funny joke. uh, One of my close friends texts me at the start of the pandemic to say, you know, I thought it was kind of weird that someone like yourself would do a public health degree uh, but now I understand why. <laughs> All of a sudden, right? <laughs> it so I would say global health has become um, center of attention politically, you know, socially, economically, yes. uh, which is great because it really um, invigorated the field. And now there's much more funding and focus and advocacy around all of these issues that that people who practice in global health has been trying to uh, influence. On the other hand, of course, none of us can travel. And with most of my programs and most of my work being outside of Canada, it's become a lot tougher. And I think um, the era of virtual everything has really helped. Um, Of course, it doesn't replace things like skills transfer for surgical skills. So um, I would say one of the advantages that I've seen is if you work with a group of people who Um, have very strong in the field or or local personnel. Um, So a lot of my Nepal program, it's not built just by me. There is an entire team. There's local hospital staff that are in charge of certain certain aspect of my programs. And having on the ground people that are local, that live there, Mm -hmm. really made a difference to try to still continue part of our program. 
Um, and then the other part is I use a lot of WhatsApp, a lot of WhatsApp of chatting with my trainees and they send me cases and photos and so that I can continue to teach them and continue to kind of give them pointers on uh, what to do with complicated cases and if there's a complication from their surgeries, what to try. And I think just being available and, you know, with these electronic communication where it's not time sensitive, it's mm -hmm. really been useful. So she'll text me in the middle of the night while my phone's on silent and I'll respond to her first thing in the morning when I wake up. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. It's a different type of medicine that we're all practicing, right? It's, uh, it's exciting in many respects, as you say. Yeah, and I just want to highlight one work, one group I think that has really been at this type of virtual teaching for quite a long time, which is Orbis's cyber site department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've done some incredible work. They've been in existence since I was a resident and first got introduced to them. Um, and they have really a large um, um, depot of high quality, you know, internationally renowned lectures. And they also have built a secure platform for consults and, and virtual surgery, et cetera, that is really a pioneer compared to you know, what the rest of us have been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have seen some of the programs that they have, and it is truly uh, impressive how they manage that. Thank you for that. I guess a lot of it also during these past two years have been sort of finding opportunities in the face of challenge as well, right? Absolutely. And I think human is incredible. We come up with the most innovative things when we're faced with a big challenge. Icon wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. Hi, I'm Dr. Nupra Bakshi and I listen to the ICANN podcast and it's awesome. Tell us a little bit more about your work with a little bit related topic, right? The Canadian Association of Public Health and Global Ophthalmology, CAFCO. And uh, how did you become involved? How long have you been involved? And what are the main projects that you have going on? So CAFCO is a subsection of the Canadian Ophthalmology Society. Um, it went through a rebranding. So the name CAFCO is new. And the executives mm -hmm. from CAFCO came up with it back in 2018 when we started to uh, reinvent the group. Um, it is basically the public health and global ophthalmology section for COS. Mm -hmm. uh, and through feedbacks from members in attending annual meetings, there was really a desire, like you mentioned, to get involved. So we got a lot of questions like, how can I get involved with global health? I want to give back to this to you know, the community, to society, to the world. And they came from both young residents, but also from mid-career practitioners, mid-career clinicians who felt like, you know, I've, I've made it now, I wanna give back some of my time and, and efforts. Mm -hmm. So we rebranded it to go beyond just planning for the annual meeting, focusing a lot more on uh, networking, uh, providing information for members, uh, and really providing a structure of um, being able to react or act to demands or requests from membership. Mm -hmm. And I think CAFCO really kind of took off during uh, Vision 2020. So unfortunately, Vision 2020 was supposed to be a big celebration for global ophthalmology, but that was also the same year where mm -hmm. we had the pandemic hit. And there were two key events that happened that year one was the launch of the World Report on Vision. Mm -hmm. So we had a virtual press release um, hosted um, by CAFCO uh, along with IAPB, the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness, which is the acting arm for the WHO on vision health. Uh, and that subsequent year in 2021 led to the UN resolution on eye health. And that was very major politically, as it was the first time the UN has ever adopted anything on eye health uh, as something that was important that 
impacted not only general health, but also um, poverty, um, um, you know, general health and development goals of the UN. So I think through 2020, it became um, almost like a jumping board for CAFCO to really become uh, much more um, within the attention of COS members. And so along those lines, there, there seems to be kind of an expansion of the, uh, of the role of CAFCO. Um, there may be some intersections with advocacy as well. How, uh, how do you think both um, areas can complement each other? Yeah, so when I first started in global health, I never thought um, I would take on an advocacy role or a political role at all. And that really changed beyond my imagination because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think back now to some of the definitions of global health or global ophthalmology, which is the promotion of health and prevention and treatment of disease, you start to realize that there are a lot of social determinants of health that is not directly medicine related. So a lot of what CAFCO members do and those who are interested in this field, a lot of them involve in research on inequities and access, which as we know in, in the public arena or in the media now, a lot of it is advocacy, advocacy for gender, racial, as well mm. as um, ethnic uh, equity, um, you know, the war, the war in uh, Ukraine comes to mind. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, ethnic cleansing around the world that creates a lot of health issues, such as the COS initiative to try to fundraise for uh, Polish ophthalmologists to provide eye care to Ukraine refugee. So a lot of time you'll find that global health or public health start to intersect mm -hmm. or is the result um, of political unrest or economic, you know, issues or, um, you know, war and advocacy starts to become just part of that inherently. Um, I think it's, it's also made me teach a lot of the young residents that they have to keep their mind open and their eyes open on how world events can shape health for many individual, um, you know, if you look at things from a global perspective. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, that's that's extremely important and interesting at the same time. Um, in many of the areas that you work are obviously in developing countries or, or people where maybe the financial resources are not as abundant as in other places. Have you seen impact of, of things like social impact bonds or uh, development bonds? I remember seeing a project uh, about that and cataract surgery, and I'm not sure if it was in Rwanda, but it was presented. And I thought it was always very interesting how people could contribute or companies or industry could contribute, capitalize on that, but at the same time providing a lot of care in a needed area. Absolutely. So I am aware of quite a few of those, especially coming from the World Bank. Mm. Um, the these bonds are and and or any financial support or funding are very important to capitalize or ca like to really stimulate um, the start of programs. So they may not be the source or the solution to poverty or to some of these health issues but they're important to test the model or to get us over a hump of something, for example. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The refugee health or, or a sudden need or a sudden pandemic is what comes to mind where you need a surge of funding just to really ramp up and skill up services. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say long-term wise, we really look to local governments to sustain some of those programs so as much as these bonds and, and funds and private foundations really help, um, at the same time, as you get a program rolling, one of the other things we also think about is really working with local government and Ministry of Health and getting them to buy in and getting them to start investing in their own um, um, health system. One example is that I would say, although it, it went off to a bumpy start, but has stabilized and become a success story is universal health care in Nepal. Okay. So when we first started, Nepal is very much dependent on external aid. All the healthcare provision was provided through foundations, provided through donors, but now they're starting to recognize that and the central government of Nepal decided to take on a model where the central government will 
distribute financial resources to, to districts, which then administer the healthcare. So now cataract surgery is actually free in Nepal and no longer charged to the patient. Excellent. Well, th- th- this has been an amazing conversation, Vivian. And uh, as we're beginning to wrap up, we always ask our our guests uh, a little bit about what they do aside from the work, the amazing and wonderful work that you're doing. So for example, what can you tell us a little bit about your extracurricular activities, favorite books or podcasts, aside from the I Can podcast, of course, mm-hmm. hobbies or activities outside of your professional life? Anything you'd like to share with us? So I'm a big foodie um, oh, and good. I and I actually enjoy cooking, but I think the one thing people may not know about me is that I've aspired to be a professional chocolatier. Oh, so wow. I make truffles <laughs> and I take some of the professional chocolate classes to try to perfect my skill. Uh, those in Toronto would know that I used to do a massive chocolate delivery as Christmas presents for the entire department in Toronto. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you're talking to the right person because I am a chocoholic. So uh, I we'll hope to see you some, soon. <laughs> we'll have to send some your way. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, at this point, we would like to thank our guest, Dr. Vivian Yin, for joining us in this, our last episode of season two. With this, we come to the end of season two. And we are grateful to have been able to bring you such varied content and thank our guests and our listeners who have made ICANN so popular. We look forward to sharing more with you in September. ICANN wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. The ICANN podcast has been made possible by support from MD Financial Management and Scotiabank, proud financial partners of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and Canada's ophthalmologists. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The ICANN podcast is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works.